Andrian, thank you so much. Uh, Ika is a Obu Ika is a great storyteller, and she is also a great presenter. And she graduated from one of the best universities in Australia, Wollongong University. I know that for a fact because I was one of her PhD uh, examiners, and I gave her a very very good grade. Excellent, you, excellent, Ika. <laughs> yes, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, what I am going to do is to provide you with a bit more illustrations, a bit more explanations about why stories are good, why storytelling is good, why story listening is good, and why story reading is also extremely good. Uh, very briefly, look at my slide. I think you have seen uh, these stories before. The first one is the uh, Red Little Riding Hood, right, Buika? Yeah. And then Cinderella. These are all time favorites for young children all over the world. And this is a local story. And uh, here is another one. I think you are all very familiar with these stories, and each story is memorable because they are easy to remember, they are enjoyable to read, and they are very interesting to uh, listen to uh, as well. And the Andilamut is a local story from Java, actually, which I enjoyed uh, very, very much. Let me begin by asking you to think about a problem here. A graduating student from a teacher education university, that's UPI, Teacher Education University is UPI. Uh, my university is NTU, but I belong to the Faculty of Education. So the UPI Singapore is uh, the National Institute of Education. A graduating student from a teacher education university is unsure, not very sure. I mean, she's been studying for three or four years now, and she, but she's not very sure whether teaching is a good career for her. And she has come to you for advice. Do you think I should become a teacher or do you think I should work in a company and making a lot of money in the process? So my question to you is which of these two ways, which of the two, these two pieces of explanations would make a lot of sense, would be more successful, would be more effective from that particular student? Andrian, think very carefully. The first way is to tell that guy or that student about what teaching, uh, what the teaching job entails, what the requirements are, the salary and the uh, long hours of teaching and marking and no weekends and things like that. And the career prospects, which can be very bright for some people, but not so bright for other people. And plus, you also need to mention about, hey, if you become a teacher, people will sing to you every year, the Pahlawan <laughs> Jasa. So that is one way of giving advice yeah, to, this, to this girl. The other one is by telling a story. And the story is this, the starfish story, which I'm going to share with you what the story is all about. Yeah, later, Adrian, uh, tell me which one is more effective. Now, here's a story. The story of the starfish is a very, very interesting story, which I enjoyed very much. One day, a young man was walking along the beach when he noticed, not she, he noticed an older woman picking something up and gently throwing it into the ocean. Approaching the woman, the young man asked, hey, what are you doing? And the woman replied, well, throwing starfish back into the ocean. The tide is going out soon. And if I don't throw them back, they will die each and every single one of these starfish is going to die. And then the young man said, oh, 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 but don't you know, don't you realize that there are hundreds and hundreds of starfish on the beach every day? You can't possibly make a difference. The old woman, after listening politely, uh, she bent down, picked up another starfish, and threw it back into the sea. And then smiling at the man, she said, I made a difference to that one. So 
So Andrian, which one is more powerful? Which one is more convincing? Which one is more effective in giving advice to this girl who is not very sure whether she should, you know, uh, begin a career as a teacher? The story or the facts? Definitely the story. Yes, because today's theme is about stories that we have to say the story. Yes, the <laughs> stories are more interesting, are more powerful, are more effective. We tell stories every day. Stories are easy to understand. Stories are memorable, easy to remember uh, as well. More importantly, stories make us more alive. Stories make us more human. In fact, research, recent research, recent brain research tells us that our for stories. That is onya, we are created in order to tell and enjoy stories. We become more courageous, we become more loving after we listen to stories. So today, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to talk about three things. Uh, the benefits of stories, which Ibuika has already mentioned a great deal, but I will mention this very briefly, very quickly, in particular, the benefits in relation to literacy development, in relation to language development, in relation to developing English language or other language proficiency through reading, through listening, and through storytelling. And number two, very important for us as language teachers is to understand the kind of methodology, the kind of teaching approaches that we have been doing for many, many years. And I'm going to share you with you two major approaches to language teaching. And hopefully you will be able to see that story-based pedagogy is the way to go. Yeah, which is my point number three. The first one, the benefits. Very briefly, because Buika has mentioned uh, the benefits, uh, values. Yeah, stories are a great way to teach values, not to teach in the sense that you tell students that values are important, kindness is important, honesty is important, hard work is important, not in that sense, but through, uh, through a story, through something that they can relate to, through something that has a very interesting uh, plot, interesting development, uh, interesting development in a story. Yeah, stories have been shown to be a great way to teach, especially young children during their formative years. And that's why bedtime reading, bedtime reading, so you read aloud to kids, to your children before they go to bed, is an excellent, excellent way for you to teach values to your students. It can enhance the student's emotional intelligence. I think Buika also mentioned this uh, a lot, uh, to build empathy, to build compassion, you know, regardless of differences, regardless of whether the child is from other countries, from other provinces, I think you will be able to develop this universal, uh, you know, emotional uh, skills or emotional ability, if you like. Understanding cross-cultural uh, differences. This is another important thing in Indonesia. I think we value diversity. Uh, differences are wonderful. Imagine if everyone looks exactly the same like me. I think the world is not a fun place to be with, to be in. Yeah. Imagine if everyone is like Ibu Ika, uh, then the world would be a wonderful place. Oh. <laughs> uh, now, interestingly, uh, I think Pahendra mentioned this as well early on, or Ibu Safrina. Uh, children who read a great deal also tend to perform well in school, not only uh, in relation to language literacies, like reading, writing, listening, and speaking, but also other areas of language uh, subjects that are usually taught in school. Uh, in primary school, for example, kids who read a great deal tend to perform better in sciences, in geography, in social studies, and also in Mathematics, surprise, surprise. People who read well, children who read well, tend to do well uh, in math uh, tests as well. Now, the benefits actually go beyond what I just mentioned. The benefits actually, uh, you know, uh, is, is, is more than just, you know, school or, or academic development. Biological research shows that stories are dopamine uh, booster. Now, dopamine is interesting. 
it's a chemical, a kind of chemical that our body produces in response to something that is pleasurable. And reading, listening to stories is something that is pleasurable. And if we do a lot of reading, a lot of listening to stories, then our body will produce a lot of dopamine. And dopamine is what makes us feel happy, feel satisfied, and feel pleasurable. Yeah, so it has a lot of benefits uh, for us as well. Now, because reading is so useful, is so beneficial, it, reading makes you happy. Uh, this, these are some of the books that I've been reading or that I've read for the past few uh, months, which I'm going to share with you. Mindset, Grit, and the middle one is Late Bloomers. And these books make me really, really happy because the main message of these books is the same. Every single one of us can be the best that we can be if we try hard enough. Let me say that again. Every one of us, you, me, it doesn't matter whether you come from Aceh or from Palembang or from Central Java or from Bandung or from Japan, we can be successful if we put in sufficient effort in whatever that we do. That to me is a very, very good message and that message makes me really, really happy. The middle one in particular, the middle one makes me extremely happy. It's about late bloomers. And the whole book is talking about age. Age does not matter, everyone. The older you become, the smarter you will be and the wiser you become. So that is the main message that makes me really, really happy. Now, more importantly, let me focus a bit more on the language learning benefits. Two things that makes reading really powerful. Number one, I think Buika also mentioned this early on, that storytelling, story reading, story listening can help students increase their word knowledge. Now, word knowledge has two meanings. Number one is the number of words that you know. Very important. The more words you know, the higher, the better your uh, literacy skills. And number two, the depth, how well you know the words is also another important factor uh, that has a great influence on your ability to speak, to read, to write, and to understand language. So this is the major, major, major benefit of reading, listening, uh, and storytelling. The second one, also extremely important, and I think we know this, that if, you know, if we continue reading, if we read a great deal, our world knowledge also increases. We know a lot more about different places. We know a lot more about different cultures. We know a lot more about histories, about the arts, about the politics, and uh, many, many other things. Now, these two things are related, ladies and gentlemen, word knowledge and world knowledge. People who have a lot of vocabulary may still struggle when they read something that they're not very familiar with. And that is where the world knowledge comes into the picture. The more knowledge you have, the easier it is for you to understand things. Yeah. So word knowledge and world knowledge. In other words, in terms of the language benefits, let me summarize this in terms of the four major skills. Reading and listening to stories can help you improve your listening skills, your reading skills, your speaking skills, and also your writing skills as well. Yeah, so that is the main language learning benefits. Now, let me move on now. So part one of my presentation is about the benefits. Yeah, I hope you remember the many, many benefits associated with reading. Now, let me say this in one sentence. Reading and listening to stories are the main ways, are the main ways for your children, for your students to become more skillful to become better to develop their English language proficiency. Yeah, so that is the main message now. Second part of my presentation is about the you know approaches to language teaching. I'm going to share with you two approaches to language teaching. There are many other approaches that you may have heard, but essentially there are two. The first one is known as teaching language as knowledge. 
Yeah, the second one is teaching language as ability. Now, let me say this to everyone in the audience in many, many places in the world where English is taught as a second or as a foreign language in Indonesia, in Thailand, in Korea, in Japan, and in many other places. The first one, the first approach, teaching language as knowledge is the most popular. In other words, many teachers use this approach to teach language. But what I'm saying today is that hmm, teaching language as knowledge, as knowledge can be a little bit useful, but I think most of our teaching, uh, most of the things that we do in the classroom should be based on the idea of teaching language as ability. And I'm going to explain to you what it means, teaching language as ability. Let me begin with the first one, teaching language as knowledge. I hope you can relate to this. Yeah. Now, this is also known as the part approach to language teaching. Part means this. Yeah, you're teaching language, you're teaching English, you're teaching French, you're teaching Japanese, whatever the language is. Now, the first thing you do is you break up the language into many, 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 many parts. And what are these parts? It's the sounds, the pronunciation, the vowels, the consonants, the spelling, the words, what else? The uh, phrases, you know, parts of speech, word order, sentence structures, tenses, narrative structures, and things like that. Now, these are known as parts. Now, if you take the approach you know, teaching language as knowledge, this is what you do. You break the language up into small segments, small elements like this. And then what do you do? You teach each one of them, one at a time, step by step. Satu demi satu, step by step, yeah? And that's what we do. That's what many of us do uh, in our classroom. Now, the question is this. If we teach in this way, do you think the students will then be able to speak whole, to understand? Yeah, poor Nofi uh, shakes her head. Thank you very much. No, the answer is it's not possible. Yeah, it's not possible. What is the reason? Now, here is the reason. Yeah, when you teach parts, even though you are very effective, you are very efficient in teaching the parts, this is what, what happens. You are teaching disconnected bits of knowledge, disconnected, unrelated, disjointed bits of knowledge of the language, the sounds, the spellings, the words, the sentences, and things like that, yeah? Will that enable you to produce the language fluently, accurately, appropriately? The answer is no, because to produce the language in meaningful situations for communication purposes, you need to learn the language as whole. You need to see the language as connected language. And stories are a great example of connected discourse. Yeah, so the, 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 the first session by Ibu Ika is an example of how stories should be used as a starting point for the students to see how the language is used as connected discourse. Connected discourse is different from you know, the different parts of a language because when you produce language, when you speak, when you share a story, when you tell what happened uh, yesterday to your spouses, to your children and things like that, you always, always have the context of the situation, the P-A-C-C. The P is the purpose. Using language must be based on a very clear purpose. I'm telling you this because, yeah, the purpose. The A is the audience. The audience means that the words that you use will be different whether you speak to a child, whether to, you speak to a friend, whether you speak in a formal situation like what I'm doing now. So the audience make a difference in terms of the language that you need in order to produce the language. C is context, whether it's informal context, whether it's formal context, whether it's in written form, whether it's in spoken form. And the final C is culture. Language is always intricately bound with the culture of the situation. 
Yeah. So I hope you can see here that if you've been teaching using the uh, the approach known as teaching uh, languages knowledge, then you can't really expect your students to become proficient to become good language users. Yeah. So what do we do? I think we need to consider the other approach more carefully. And the other approach is known as teaching language as ability. Now, when you teach language as ability, this is what you do. The starting point is not the part. The starting point is the whole. And the whole here can be a story. The whole here can be a dialogue. The whole here can be anything that is uh, you know, contextualized, that is meaningful, that is purposeful a piece of communication uh, that you come across on a daily basis. Yeah, and then you pay attention a little bit to the parts and then you get the students to look at the whole again. So the name of the uh, approach is whole part and whole. And this approach is based on a very, very important principle of language learning, of language acquisition. And that principle says learning happens when students let me hide the, uh, here you go. When, when happens when students focus mostly on meaning. Yeah, the key word here is mostly. It doesn't mean that we can't pay attention, we can't get the students to pay attention to the language aspects, but the bulk of our lesson will have to be organized in terms of how we can expose students to meaningful language. And that's the kind of things that can uh, really help students develop their English language pro proficiency. Uh, some of you may have seen these two people on the screen. The left hand side is a very well known uh, applied linguist. Uh, the name is Rod Ellis, and he has done a lot of research in the area of second language acquisition. And the, the guy on the right hand side is somebody who is talking to you right now. So, a bit more about the whole part whole, teaching language as ability. This is the uh, theoretical foundation for all of us as language teachers, yeah? So this is a further explanation of what I, I just explained to you. Whole text means yeah, stories, movie clips, TV shows for children, Netflix movies, TED talks or any other uh, you know, stories or narrative text or non-narrative text uh, that you can use in your teaching. The middle part, yeah, pay attention, Bapak Ibu, pay attention very carefully here. The parts here doesn't mean that we teach everything. We, we don't teach every language features that are present in the text, no. We just focus on the most important features of the language. And then we spend some time maybe explaining uh, to the students why the language features are used. There's no need for you to spend one whole hour explaining the present tense that is used in the text. There's no reason for you to explain, you know, in you know, 20 minutes, the use of the past perfect tense uh, in a particular text that you're using in the classroom because you will be killing students' motivation in that way. And then the next bit is this. Yeah, once you have gone through uh, the whole text and highlight the uh, key features of the language, and then you put the language features back into whole stories as well, maybe using a different version of the story. Remember children's stories, they come in many, many different versions. Yeah, uh, Red Riding Hood version one, Red Riding Hood version two, Red Riding Hood version three, or Snow White version one, Snow White version two, and so on and so forth. So the same text can be used again, but maybe with some variations. But the key thing here is that the students are shown the whole text and the students are also paying attention to some of the important language features. And then the students get to see the whole text again. So those are the two approaches. I hope it's clear, yeah, Baba Ibu? Uh, so the first part of my presentation is about the uh, uh, benefits of storytelling, story listening, and story reading. In particular, I focus on how listening to stories, reading stories can help students develop their word knowledge and also their world knowledge. Very important. 
And then I discuss with you two major approaches. One is teaching language as, as, as knowledge, and the other one is teaching language as ability. We now move on to story-based pedagogy very briefly. My job is very easy because Buika uh, has already done a good job in explaining what story-based pedagogy is all about, but I'm going to do it in a slightly different way. Yeah, story-based pedagogy. Now, these are three of the most well-known pedagogies, story-based pedagogies. They are very, very, very similar. In fact, in some places, these three things are essentially the same. The first one is known as shared book reading. The second one is interactive reading. The third one is dialogic reading. What Buika did is a great example of interactive reading or dialogic reading or even shared book reading. Yeah, I think you have seen that uh, in the earlier uh, presentation. So what is important to remember is that this is what we have called reading with the teachers because the students are not able to do it on their own. They need advice. They need somebody who is more uh, you know, knowledgeable, somebody who are better than the students to help them with the reading. And because of that story-based pedagogy, like shared book reading or interactive reading or dialogic reading is known as supported reading or scaffolded reading. I think Buika mentioned this as well scaffold it. You need somebody to help the students to read, to understand, to appreciate uh, what the students are reading. Okay. Now here is an example. Yeah, in Singapore, this is what happens in primary English language classrooms. This is what students and the teachers do in the classroom. A great example of shared book reading. Yeah, a big book containing a very interesting, very easy to under, understand stories is blown up into a big book like this. And then the teacher will go through the story with the students, making sure that the students are having uh, you know, a happy time uh, following and understanding and maybe discussing the uh, contents of the book a little bit with the teacher. Yeah, it looks like this. There's a lot of things happening here. There's a lot of teaching happening, but not the kind of teaching that we usually do. Not the kind of teaching that involves, okay, the present tense is, these are the rules of the present tense. No, nothing like that. It's more like, hey, pay attention to how this word is spelled. Hey, pay attention to this. Why is it in the present tense, not in the past tense? That sort of thing, very briefly, and then the teachers move on. But most of, most of the time, the teachers will direct the student's attention, direct the student's, uh, you know, story uh, by following, you know, the story in terms of its plot. What's going to happen next? What do you think is going to happen to Snow White at the end of the story? So teaching students how to predict, how to think ahead uh, together with the teacher. Yeah. Now, if you are looking for something that is easy for you to remember, now here is Uh, lesson, the structure of a lesson in a book-based pedagogy, in a story-based pedagogy, itu mudah diingat, it's easy for you to remember, four steps, yeah, the first step is hook, the second step is book, the third step is look, and the last step is took. Buika, are you still there Buika, please say hook, book, look, took. Buika. Hook, yes. <laughs> hook, book, look, took. Yes. Isn't that nice to remember? It's very easy to remember. Yes. Yeah. Hook, book, look, and took. So this can be a structure, a very useful structure for you when you teach anything in the classroom, including uh, teaching language. The first one, hook. Hook means the first thing you need to do is to make sure that you are able to get the attention of every single student in the classroom. Hook, make sure that they are interested, make sure that are motivated in your lesson, make sure that they are psychologically ready, that they are emotionally ready to listen to you, to listen to your story, for example. And very often, like what happens in Singapore, the teachers would begin the story-based lesson by 
singing, by maybe you know uh, doing a lot of, a lot of uh, you know dancing in the classroom. Usually singing, not dancing. Yeah, getting the kids to be excited about the book, about the content of the book. And then the book itself. Yeah, the book itself means the time for you to read with your students. So telling a story just by going through the story, reading aloud the story with your, to your students is not a good idea. The idea is that you have to read with, you have to involve the students in the story. That's why it's also called shared book or dialogic reading or interactive reading. Yeah. And then look essentially is, you know, you spend maybe a few minutes highlighting, getting students' attention to some of the most important language features. For example, hey, when you speak to somebody uh, whom you respect, you have to use could, for example, or may instead of can. So you are highlighting some of the language features. Hey, look at the spelling of this word. Yeah. Now the spelling is very tricky because it has double S there in the middle. And then finally, uh, the last one is you recap the whole lesson, take away, but you do it in a fun way. Maybe another singing, maybe uh, writing a poem together, uh, maybe memorizing one or two lines of the stories. They are very easy to remember. So the structure usually goes like this. If you teach young children, or even if you teach older children, older adults, I think this structure is very useful. Hook, book, look, and took. Okay, the next question for us is this. We have looked at how, uh, you know, teacher guided or teacher supported reading can happen in the classroom. We have also seen the benefits of teacher story-based pedagogy and things like that. The question is, is it enough? Bunafi, is it enough or not enough? Please say not enough. Only one answer, not enough. Not enough. Not enough, yes, because... Not support, enough. Yes, not enough. Because supported reading is the first step, yeah? And the next step is a bridge towards independent reading. Now, independent reading is also known as pleasure reading, self-selected reading. This is what happens in Singapore. Yeah, after they have done the uh, shared book, the interactive book reading with the teachers, with help from the teachers, this is what they are supposed to do. And then they pick a book of their choice and then they start reading in the classroom and at home or on the bus or in any other places in and the school. So very briefly, uh, independent reading or self-directed reading is also known as reading for pleasure or reading for recreation. Again, it's not for teaching basically, but interestingly, when you read for pleasure, when you read for recreation, you get the benefits, a lot of benefits, including language learning benefits. Yeah, so very minimal teaching, if you like. Uh, students read for pleasure. Students read for general information. They don't need about. They don't need to know about small, small details, like how old was Snow White or how old was Timon Mas, for example. What was the name of the neighbor uh, of Timon Mas? For example? No need to remember all these details. Focus on the big picture. Focus on the big information. Yeah, and finally. Uh, this is the kind of reading not for study purposes. Bukan untuk studi, bukan untuk belajar. Not for study purposes, but it's for pleasure, for general uh, information. Now, essentially, when you do storytelling or story listening, which I will call extensive reading or extensive listening or independent reading or self-directed reading, the materials or the characteristics will have to be like this. Yeah, so the story or the book that the students choose to read, number one, will have to be very, very interesting. The reason, very simple. If the book is not interesting, they will put it down immediately. They read the first page, that's it, forget it. Compelling means super, super exciting, super, super interesting. 
It's so compelling that when the moment you start reading on the first page, you want to stay reading until you get to the end. Sampai jam 1 atau jam 2 pagi mungkin. Until 1 a.m. in the morning or 2 a.m. in the morning. Because you want to know how the story ends. Number two, another important thing for us to remember is this. Independent reading, self-directed reading, we'll have to agree to this principle that the, that the language is accessible, that the language is easy, that the language is at the student's level. If it is too challenging, they won't continue reading. Yeah, they will just put it aside. No, this book is not for me. This one is just too difficult for me. And next one, very important criterion is this. If you are interested in seeing the effect of reading on language development, then the students will have to read. The students will have to read in massive quantity. Massive means they have to do it every day over a period of time, maybe one year, maybe two years, maybe three years, or maybe forever. Yeah, so the amount will have to be massive. Uh, Bonigrum, I will send you the slides later, so you don't need to take uh, photos. It's very easy. And the last one is you need to make available a wide range of stories, a wide range of reading and listening materials to your students so that they can choose, so that they can pick that they want to listen to or that they want to read. Now, again, here are the links, the relationship between reading and listening and uh, reading, reading and writing and uh, listening and speaking. Yeah, if you read a great deal, chances are you'll become a good writer. You'll be able to write well, you'll be able to write fluently, coherently for different purposes, maybe using different modalities and different channels as well. If you have become fluent listeners, I think you'll be able to speak well. You'll be able to express yourself clearly uh, and fluently and coherently uh, as well. Now, if you do both listening and reading, I think your overall language proficiency will also improve a great deal. So that is the power of story listening and story reading. Let me end by sharing with you some important quotes from experts. Now, one of the experts in the field of independent reading, pleasure reading is a professor, retired professor by the name of Stephen Krashen. And this is what he says many, many years ago. Uh, Ibu Ika is going to read this for me. Ibu Ika, are you still there? Ibu Ika, yes. Yes. Yeah. yes, please read this slowly. <laughs> when enough reading is done, all the necessary grammatical structures and discourse rules for writing will automatically be presented to the writer in sufficient quantity. Yes, Buika reads very nicely, yeah? <laughs> Buika, can you please read it again? I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, so, uh, <laughs> so reading and writing, yeah? But the key word here is sufficient quantity. If you just read a book, your writing will not improve. You need to read 1,000 books and mm. your words will flow like a river. Mm. Ah, here is about listening. So I am just echoing what Stephen Krashen says, but instead of reading, I changed reading to listening. Buika, read this again. The same quote, basically, yeah? Okay. When enough when enough listening is done, all the necessary grammatical structures and discourse rules for speaking will automatically be presented to the speaker in sufficient quantity. In sufficient quantity. So reading and listening are good. Reading and listening are excellent uh, for us to help students develop their speaking and also their writing uh, abilities. But you may be saying, you know, asking, yes, reading is good, listening is good, but where do we get the materials? Hey, there's a lot of materials out there on the internet available for free. Here is one example, Storyline Online, excellent resource for teachers. It doesn't matter where you are, as long as you have access to the internet, 
And if your students have access to the internet, they can read, they can listen to these stories read aloud by very well-known people, uh, movie stars, uh, movie actors, uh, country re uh, le political leaders, and, and many other uh, celebrities. Yeah, storyline online, free access for you. Uh, if you're looking for books, go to the Asia Foundation website, Books for Asia. Again, it has hundreds or maybe thousands of books available, written in different languages. So you get to see the English version, the Java, I'm not sure about the Javanese, but the Bahasa Indonesia version and uh, other language versions as well. Again, all this can be downloaded for free. What you need to do is start thinking about how you can change your pedagogy from teaching language explicitly, teaching language rules uh, in the classroom to teaching using stories like this. And if, if you don't have a lot of time, but you have some money, then you can try this excellent resource is called X reading and my colleague later Paul Goldberg is going to talk about how this library digital library can help your students to develop their English language proficiency by doing a lot of reading and by doing a lot of listening. All the 1000 plus books are available 24 hours a day and the students can read and can listen any time and the teachers can also monitor, check, and help and support the students in the process of reading and listening to stories. So the name is X Reading and Paul Goldberg, my colleague from the Extensive Reading Foundation is going to share with you more about how this can work uh, in your school uh, situations. Ladies and gentlemen, I have shared with you very briefly, three major points. Number one is the benefits of stories. I hope you have now become more convinced that stories are good for you, for your students, and stories are the kind of things that make you happy and healthy as well. I have also shared with you two approaches to language teaching, teaching language as knowledge and teaching language as ability. And finally, I've also shared with you what has been referred to as a story-based pedagogy using a very simple structure like hook, book, look, took. And that is how you can engage students in the classroom, in the lesson, using stories as the basis for organizing your lesson. Ladies and gentlemen, I begin with a story and I'm going to end with a story as well. Remember the beginning of the story is uh, making a difference, yeah, starfish. Now this is my end. Listen to my story. Now, this story is dedicated for Ibu Ibu Guru, not for the Bapa, yeah? All the Ibu Ibu Guru in the audience. Now, here is how the story goes, yeah? Uh, ten men and one woman are hanging onto a rope, a rope that comes down for, from a helicopter. The helicopter is in trouble, so they have to, you know, come down through uh, the rope. But the rope is not strong enough for 11 people. So one of them will have to let go of the rope. If not, then the rope is going to break. So one has to go, but nobody wants to let go of the rope. But the woman volunteers. Yes, let me do it. I will let go of the rope so that all of you can live and survive. But before she lets go of the rope, she gives a speech, a very touching speech. And she says that as a woman, I am used to looking after my husbands, looking after my children, and that's what women are for. We sacrifice or we sacrifice for men and the children in our life. And all the men begin to cry and then they clap their hands. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> So who is left on the rope? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> My website has a lot of resources. Feel free to download all the books and other resources. The name of the address is willyrenandia.com. Uh, and I will send my slides 
uh, the link to my slide uh, using the chat box. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for listening. Thank you very much, Pa Willy. Everyone, another big round of virtual applause for Pa Willy. Please uh, choose a reaction and also type clap, clap, clap on your Zoom chat for that wonderful and eye-opening presentation. A very interesting plot twist as well.